Dobrý večer, dámy a pánové. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's a great honor for us to be here and to speak on the topic that may raise an interesting discussion. Some of us uh, who have met before and who have known each other for years may remember the beginnings of the Visegrad uh, group. We might uh, remember uh, when Václav Havel, one of the key initiators and co-authors of uh, this uh, of the Visegrad Declaration made his uh, notes, which I found uh, among the Visegrad documents. He said how important it is not to forget the struggle for human rights in the broadest meaning of the term. I quote, it's necessary to insist on um, uh, a final closure of the Second World War and its uh, nefarious consequences, but uh, this closure must... Uh, uh, we are speaking about the year 1991, 1990, 1991. He said that part of this closure should be also the... Uh, the affirmation of European borders and that nobody could ever question the border issue. So this was set at the beginning of the Visegrad process and today we are in a situation, as we have heard in the previous block or panel, that the word war is reappearing again over and over again and under the influence of the Paris events, some uh, politicians uh, consider it important to speak about the state of war. I was told that uh, uh, it is uh, not necessary to introduce uh, individual panelists, yet I uh, uh, we'll uh, do it because, uh, as far as I know, um, Mr. Tamash has not been here as a guest before. Therefore, I would like to say a few words about uh, him. A few months ago in Austria, uh, his book, uh, Communism After 1989, uh, was published. This. Um, uh, here he is characterized as a person who um, evolved from one dissident situation into another dissident situation. He is an intellectual from Transylvania who lived um, until, who worked until 1978 as a journalist, but then he had to leave to Hungary where he uh, worked uh, at uh, Budapest University. He is a man who was um, expelled from um, Romania in 1981, and then after 1989, he was a candidate for the Union of Free Democrats. He was elected a member of parliament. So after 1989, uh, he was very active not only in politics, but also as a university teacher. In, uh, the, his, um, in the political development uh, of the last year, his existential situation has uh, completely changed because um, uh, Tamash, uh, Mr. Tamash is uh, not taken in Hungary today as one of the most important uh, personalities of dissent until 1989. 
and as an active politician after 1989. And although this is not the correct label, you are returning to Romania, where you are observing the developments, where you also publish your works, but also where you are very active, but you are also active in a number of other areas. Therefore, I would like to start by asking you, how do you see the Visegrad process and what has remained of it? And to what extent do you consider it appropriate to speak about the Visegrad today? Can you hear? Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry. Well, thank you for the beautiful words about me. I don't, don't really deserve them. But uh, what, regards, what regards the Visegrad counties, um, you know, there are some similarities between them. And in one respect, <coughs> uh, the uh, demands of Václav Havel have been realized. Uh, most of the mutual hatred between these countries has disappeared, only to be replaced by profound indifference. And ignorance and turning our backs to one another, and uh, you know, uh, apart from a few colorful uh, cliches about one another's countries, we have just forgotten uh, each other. People are uh, reading uh, the same books everywhere. I've seen today here in the bookshop the works of Michel Ullebeck and Niall Ferguson, this kind of reactionary crap you can have everywhere. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, but as, as, as each other's countries are concerned, no problem whatsoever, we have forgotten you. And, but at the same time, it is quite clear that something common must be at work there. There's no other area in, uh, on the contemporary political map of the world to have four con neighboring countries from which uh, the secular, internationalist, modernizing, reformist, radical left has disappeared altogether. These countries uh, from Hungary in which you have a one-party state uh, uh, and uh, uh, where, you know, they, can't, they can even allow some dissent to exist because it's so insignificant. So what we get from the government is not so much uh, oppression but contempt. And we deserve it being so weak. And, uh, and then you have, of course, uh, Poland, where two right-wing parties are competing for power, one is worse than the other. And then you have Slovakia, uh, which is ruled by a social democratic party that, if you look at their policies, uh, is more right-wing than the Freedom Party in Austria. Uh, then you have the Czech Republic. Uh, uh, sorry for being so tender, and so I, I could be harder than that. <coughs> And then, you have the Czech, and then you have the Czech Republic, where you have uh, a, a social democratic president of the name of Miloš Zeman, who is, uh, uh, in a way, of course, the, uh, the um, um, uh, say, the vodička of the international right. Uh, and, and you remember from the Schweik book. Eh? And, and, you know, you know, and you have a social democratic party, a communist party, and the right-wing party, all nationalist, conservative, and deeply, profoundly provincial. And, okay, so, so this is the Visegrad bloc, <laughs> uh, which, is, which would be ridiculous if it weren't so tragic for the populations concerned. Uh, because you see, uh, uh, these are the countries in which economic development is arrested, in which inequalities are growing, in which uh, the only major form of existential revolt is Nazism, 
And uh, these countries are also conspicuous by the complete indifference of their public opinions towards the plights, plight of others. And we are free of refugees. No refugees. No refugees. We are all white. White, Christian, Aryan, nice people, hardworking. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and, you know, um, so you see, um, many people were talking here today about compassion and sensitivity and so on. Well, let me tell you a bit about compassion. Do you remember that van in which 71 people have suffocated? Now, uh, I am witness to the deep emotions that this has provoked in Hungarian, Hungarian public opinion. There were quite a few jokes about it. Quite a few jokes. That, that, that was all. So now that white people have been murdered in Paris, there's a lot of compassion. But they have been white. Okay? So, so this is what became... Well, of course, this um, I'm, I'm saying it in an ironical and satirical way, but I mean it all. This has become from the dream of Václav Havel. We live in one of the most disgusting areas of the world, and uh, we seem to be all so gemütlich about it, you know, so kind about it, and, and we think that Mr. Fizzo is a joke. No, he isn't. He may be ridiculous, but he's sinister. And so are the others. And I just, I just told my friends here that I've just read an article in the Hungarian newspaper by the great Central European states, statesman Václav Klaus. Václav Klaus, the great Central European statesman who was at one moment the embodiment of Western-style modernity in our countries and so on, um, just uh, writes in the Magyar Nemzet newspaper, independent conservative newspaper. I can tell you why it is independent, but yeah. the owner had just a business conflict with Viktor Orban, so the paper had become independent. And, but uh, so Mr. Klaus says the West has imposed homosexualism on us. So that's the idea of Europe, of the West, of liberty, and so on, that can be taken out. So you see, um, that's really very depressing. And we are here, and full of intelligent and admirable people, and we don't seem to be able to do anything against it. I mean, you know, why the hell not? Maybe people more intelligent than I am will answer my question. Thank you very much for the statement. Um, well, it wasn't a statement. Uh, <laughs> well, it was... Uh, <laughs> flight of fans. Mým se zeptat pana Michnika. May I ask, um, Mr. Michnik, how would you characterize the situation in these countries, primarily, of course, in Poland? What the chance is there for the original idea of Visegrad? He is so radical that uh, in uh, what you said, I heard the uh, kind of Leninist idea. If you want to understand why the left wing uh, parts of the spectrum that we speak about in our countries uh, and is that the language used by the left is an exotic language. It has uh, no close uh, connection to what's going on in these countries. My reflection on the topic of Visegrad is very sad. 
I can understand that uh, it was an enthusiastic idea. It was a kind of a response of Central Europe to what was going on at the time in the Balkans, uh, what was going on um, in the Caucasus. So there was a plan uh, that the countries uh, that were shedding the communist Soviet dictatorship uh, would create a zone of cooperation. Today, it has been transformed into a kind of a caricature of uh, itself. We have uh, uh, the, the regime, uh, regimes where we do not know if it's right or left. Uh, we know that the party at power in Slovakia has uh, leftist uh, rhetorics, but uh, a right, a rightist political program. The party at power in Poland uh, uses right-wing rhetorics, but uh, but uh, slogans of this government are um, um, extreme left. It means that the right and the left, in my opinion, uh, does not describe reality in these countries or in other countries for that matter. The main problem is whether these societies um, are open societies. It means open, tolerant, and uh, uh, focused on uh, human rights, pluralism, and the rule of law, or whether there are societies which are closed, uh, focused on uh, authority, intolerance, and uh, Today, it seems that the Visegrad group, unfortunately, is going the wrong way. The pioneer in this direction is Viktor Orban. That is our party, ruling party, which said for years ago that uh, they would uh, create Budapest in Warsaw, but I am really frightened when I see what's uh, going on and what still may be done in our country. This is a very bad uh, moment of history, not only for Poland, but for the whole of Europe, because when we look at what's uh, happening in France, at uh, the rising nationalism, when we look at what's happening in Russia and uh, what is Putin doing, we realize that, that the winning concepts are completely anachronic. anachronous. This is uh, a blind alley to which we are heading. We are not heading towards a better future. I spoke with uh, Mr. Putna, who said that today it is necessary to start building Visegrad in intellectual circles all over again as uh, a civil society of the countries of the Visegrad group that would speak to one another and cooperate independently on uh, the governments uh, whose common denomina denominator today is uh, the anti-European stance. There is also uh, an, a great uh, Cautiousness uh, regarding the policies of Putin, this is quite important. And then there is uh, xenophobia. The language spoken by politicians in our country with regards to immigrants is scandalous uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it cannot be forgiven. This reminds me of what has been spoken about today already. That is 
the kind of a new betrayal, which means that uh, an increasing number of intellectuals, artists, and uh, scientists uh, are uh, uh, succumbing to this great um, influx of chauvinism. Chauvinism is uh, like a narcotic because it blocks uh, uh, the uh, brain activities, rational thinking, and um, they are not even aware of writing or speaking, uh, things which are completely irrational. How would you interpret these old ideas uh, for the Czech Republic? I am a historian, so I try to look at the situation in analogies, uh, analogies and perspective. So I would like to come back to the word. It was a accidental symbol that in the Hungarian locality called Visegrad, the formation was constructed, but it's a fantastic symbol because Visegrad is a place in Hungary with a Slavic name, and uh, Sigismund, who was a Czech and Hungarian king, had his seat there. So it's a place which all the nations in Central Europe know and which is linking them together. So the idea is great. If to speak about the idea of Havel then, beginning of the 90s, was exactly what we call window of opportunity. That is, it was a special moment in history when the old orders and government systems, everything which seemed so petrified, suddenly ruptured, collapsed, and we see that everything is possible. Everything was possible what you manage in that time, and then the window of opportunity will close, and what you haven't managed, you will never manage again. So Václav Havel regretted that he was not sending Klaus to the Czech National Bank, and that uh, he regretted that he didn't stop Temeli nuclear power plant when he could, and the Russians want it now again, so that happened. Any case, we don't have a window opportunity today, and we, were, we have the changing times, dark times, and I wouldn't be so uh, categoric as our Hungarian colleague Tamás with his typical Hungarian nostalgia and melancholy. <laughs> so I wouldn't be as radical as him. So yes, we have darkening times. We had such times often in Europe. And it means that in these darkening times, we must manage to do what we can, but it's not much. If somebody would say, I have a plan, I have a plan, I know what to do, you know exactly that's another demagogue, probably another, another bull paid by Putin, because nobody who is realistic knows that there is no plan. There is only an effort to maintain what you can keep. And that is the idea which occurred to me yesterday when we had a meeting with President Kiska, and that is to try that what we have to try to do is to network, to try to keep the memories, to uh, re remember what we had and get re ready for the better times. And that is what Vato Havel said, that when everything seems to be lost, everything seems to be lost for a long time, in uh, communist era, in 70, 75, he wrote to Gustav Husak and he started Karta, and they didn't know whether they will manage. Probably they didn't hope that they will live long enough to see the end of communism. Even in May uh, 89, we haven't thought that it can be so close. So to get ready, Anno, yes, we have dark times, and we have to summarize the values we can stick to. And one of the values of Havel is exactly the capacity to communicate uh, between the left and the right. 
So when I studied the old materials of Havel, I was fascinated to see how Peter Uhl, a Trotskyist, and Václav Benda, an ultra-Catholic, could sit at the same table and work in a committee to defend those who were sentenced unjustly. And he could that do. He could really function as a mediator, a moderator, and they could cooperate. And one of the things we could do, and it's not a big plan, but it's a, maybe a legacy from the past. I think we should sometimes uh, stop thinking who is on the right, left, and who is on the correct, left side, and who is on the correct, right side. Uh, we should try the last sentence, and you will get your chance. So. We must only try to try to see who keeps to some fundamental principles of democracy and open society, and anyone from anarchist to anarcho-Catholic should be welcome. You were one sentence, just one, sentence. one, uh, just one remark. Uh, I would very much, uh, pardon, ja bych velmi I would be very happy if we all tried come from this intellectual heights, and maybe you could comment on how these noble humanistic ideas will be, are we capable to convey to the public, how it is beautiful to have this meeting here. And, but what we can deliver to people in the streets and how to do it. Just, I, I was just reminded, uh, I was just reminded of a wonderful remark by Alain, the great French critic, who said that who he thinks that there's no major difference between left and right is on the right. <laughs> So, um, oh, I am sorry, you have to uh, put it up. Okay, now it's okay. Oh, it's just, just a quotation from Alain, the French critic, who said that he who thinks that there's no difference between left and right is on the right. <laughs> Mr. Šimečka, maybe you would like to comment? So, good evening. I'm not a practical person, really. I'm not a pragmatic, and I'm also not an intellectual height. I can speak from the perspective of Slovakia and my own perspective. What is Central Europe for me? And I see it as I have experienced it since my youth. And that's very easy. In the 80s, I envied Hungary. <laughs> In the 90s, I envied the Czech lands. Recently, I envied Poland. And now there is nobody left I could envy. It's a very simple interpretation of Central Europe of how, we, how far we have come. On the other hand, I must say that I still think that what's happening means that we have really united. Central Europe is, for the first time, really a relevant formation built on su support to refugees, on xenophobia, on resistance to help refugees, on xenophobia. So we are really integrated politically and also in other views. I mean, it's even better than it ever was. That we don't like it is another story. And this is how it is presented today this uh, grandiose welcoming of Polish abolition of uh, quotas. The Slovak uh, prime minister welcomed Poland cordially coming back to us. So the question is, what will come? And I think, I believe, that we have a process of mutual learning of political classes. Orban wasn't the first. Mechier was the first, I think. 
and it's true that the Slovaks managed to uh, cope with it before we joined the EU. Then Mr. Orban came, and he is like a icebreaker making the way free for the others. He created hope for politicians of Kaczynski's type. And I'm afraid that in Slovakia it will continue. Fico is a very good friend with Orban. And he must have felt encouraged by last year victories of Orban in the elections. And so who in the Czech Republic will get encouragement? Uh, who will be encouraged by the development in our three countries in the Czech Republic? So the problem is, and I agree with Martin, that we, if we should go down from the heights to the ground, then we must start to talk again, because we all four are in the same black hole. That was Slovakia in the 90s, today it's Central Europe. So I think there are differences, but the only possibility how to face it today and that is because I don't want to succumb to frustration. We must talk. Because when Orban came to power, we have been ignorant to our Hungarian friends. We were not interested in what's happening there. And we are now together on the same boat. So we should start get interested in each other, also in order to get the feeling that we are not left alone. And I think this is the only thing. And and we must look for examples that function, for instance, in Slovakia. We have some very pleasant signals that our society is not dead, it's not 100 percent xenophobe, and there are small miracles like the new daily Dienik N, which is a daily which emerged here, but nowhere else in Central Europe. So it is something you can learn from, you can talk about, and we can link with it our bright future, but the bright future won't come tomorrow. Thank you. I appreciate your response that we shouldn't succumb to the negative mood when somebody lives in Austria can uh, follow from a distance what happens in other countries. In the Czech Republic, there are many initiatives which want to prevent the even worse xenophob xenophobia, which we see in many social circles. And we noticed that next 17 November, some groups which are against Islam and uh, completely xenophobic have decided to organize a demonstration held on November 17. And I think Professor Putna was one of those who organized counter activities. And uh, the deans of the Czech universities have been also, also voicing their disapproval. But these are initiatives which mostly take place at the level of intellectuals. So my question is, how can you translate this and make it understandable to people who become victims of this xenophobic nonsense. We want a plan from me, but I always say that the plan doesn't exist. What we can do is to say what we think. So on the, the 17th November, you can be on a part of an anti-xenophobic demonstration. I will be there. I will speak. I'm a historian, so I will use that. And I will say that what the xenophobic wave today does is abuse of national and religious symbols. And it's something we already had. We had that in Czechoslovakia in autumn 38, when suddenly we had the so-called patriots and so-called Catholics using St. Wenceslaus and many other things. And at the same uh, moment, they would say, and Jews out. 
and uh, the rhetorics of the current xenophobic people is very similar to that. And it's not much you can say. You, you can only give analogies. But And after Paris, it will be even more difficult. So till the 17th, I will use all my time to be sure what I want to say. Because today, it is even more difficult. Because uh, Friday 13 is not only the explosion of bombs in Paris, but it's also the explosion of champagne at the uh, Czech uh, seat of the president. They would, and also our uh, Czech bloc against uh, Islam would drink champagne. And I'm sure that Kremlin was flooded with champagne because that is what Putin needed because he will say, I will help you, and you give me Ukraine. So it's very difficult. I have no idea, but I know that I must go there, and I must say no, try to say no, 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 17th November is not yours. So we must do this step. We must resist. And if we get uh, a hit, then we get a hit, but we mustn't be silent. 1,000 people, 2,000 people, 3,000, I don't know. It's not my problem. I will do what I can. And you have said that it's my initiative. It's not mine. It's an initiative of young people. That's a good sign. So there is hope. Like we in Austria have thousands and thousands of volunteers who go every day to the stations to help. And we have thousands of refugees. And these people, unfortunately, are not really visible sufficiently. And media have understood that they should mediate this visibility. And a few days ago, Uh, Cardinal Born, who is a child of refugees who had to leave uh, Czechoslovakia in 45 and uh, ended up somewhere in Vorarlberg, west of Austria. So he formulated it very simple in a few, a few days ago. He said, we must communicate together. We must try to uh, understand it. How can you change something without having uh, idea how to change it. You must say it aloud. You must know how to address these ten thousands of people who sit somewhere in a village somewhere where the foxes bid good night, be it in Austria, Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia. People who simply are afraid. How to break this? How to break the lies which we hear so often from the highest political circles? I feel like a boxer that got a knockout and is still on the ground. And you ask me how I'm going to fight the next match or the next round immediately after defeat. So I think we should start by asking how it is possible that after 25 years of a democratic government governance, we have here these forces we see today. In each country, the picture was a bit different. But of course, we have a common denominator. And it means uh, also the question, what mistakes were made by these democratic forces? Secondly, we must ask what social processes and uh, took place in these countries where we had a victory in a democratic manner by those who won. And Klaus was there 
all the time with his rhetorics. And Orban wasn't Orban in Hungary then, but these tendencies of extreme right existed already there. And in Slovakia, we had Mečiar who used this rhetoric, but at a certain moment it looked like that they lost because Orban lost, Mečiar lost, and in Poland Kaczynski also lost. So it looked that there is a room for, posit for the positive scenario. Unfortunately, and maybe I will speak like a Polish nationalist now, but our great uh, poet Mickiewicz said that what does a farmer do when a storm destroys the harvest? They, he will sow again. That is what Mr. Putna said. We already lived worse times, and I also remember them well. When in 89 I came to Prague, I already had a diplomatic passport, and uh, we went to Hradeček to see Havel. And Havel said, this is not Poland. Here it will take a long time, really long time. At Charles Bridge, you can see that Prague is not a town that is really fit for communism. The Czechs are a nation between Schweik and Kafka. And I told him, for this, all these reasons, you will be president till the end of the year. And he became president. So there are also good news, and that is the current Slovak president. And so, yes, everything is dark, everything is getting brown, but there are also good news, like the current president. And I could speak with him yesterday, and it was really very pleasant to find out that today in Central Europe you can have a president which is not behaving like an arrogant pig. He is very normal. He will even invite a few intellectuals to ask their opinion, and he listens to. He sat there, and he was really listening to the views we presented to him. And I said, you see, this is a way how Czechoslovakia is getting recovered, because in the Czech Republic, many people looked to Slovakia and said, what a pity that Czechoslovakia didn't last, because if you were our president today, so sometimes there are these historic sentiments which may have this effect. And as Martin said, we can uh, suddenly look with surprise to the other ones. And for the Czech, Slovakia is now interesting. And it was really not for a long time so, because we had this complex look there like Robin Hood. And look, we have now an idiot, and they have a president. <laughs> Uh, you were afraid of the word beast uh, or pig? I said idiot. I would like to ask Professor Tamás now to describe the perspectives for the future that you see. I ask this uh, question exclusively with regard to Hungary. But uh, when um, I read some of your articles in which you brilliantly analyze the current situation, uh, 
I, um, thanks to the organizers, I read your analysis uh, about the meaning, for example, of the refugee crisis, in which you describe the current situation, uh, but also um, the direction to, in which it is heading uh, towards a catastrophe. Can you see any positive uh, uh, perspectives, or uh, what should we do in order to convey the public uh, what we are discussing here, how to launch a dialogue that would not be limited to universities or to this beautiful theater or to the Slovak president's uh, office, but in order to also speak in public, how to convey this message. It would be nice if uh, I could make a dialogue with the Slovak peasantry, but I just can't just you have to organize that, mm. you know, because you have to find your ways to the people and then I'll follow you. But, you know, to have a dialogue between between poor people in the provinces, that's I think is a utopia for you know, it's okay if we start among ourselves to talk. You know, I'm very ashamed to say that, you know, since eighty nine I've been about thirty times to New York. It's my second time in Bratislava. And this is not right. And this is not right. That's, I confess that it's wrong. It is wrong, and I shouldn't uh, have been like that. And I speak uh, um, a few languages, but no Slavic language. That's also wrong. And, um, uh, but talking about Hungary, and I won't make any long histories because there's no time for that. But you have to take into account that in Hungary you don't have a right-wing government. You have a regime. That's a system. It's a closed system that has changed the constitution in which there's no division of powers, in which there's no balance between the different powers, in which, in which, in which, in which uh, uh, actually there's no, there are no party system, that just apparatuses. No, no memberships. It's not true that Viktor Orban is mobilizing them, he's demobilizing, condemning them to absolute passivity. And, and the whole thing is not even traditional, it's not based on traditional Hungarian nationalism at all. This is the far right. This is the Aryan, white, Christian thing that doesn't have even the old, very nasty, you know, nationalism against our neighbors. You know, you, you may have heard that kasha nem etel tot nem ember. Okay, do you know that? That means kasha is not a meal and the Slovaks are not human. Okay, that, that, was, that was said in the time of Count Tisa, whose statue had been re-erected in the Koshut Square. Of course, in the Koshut Square because they were enemies. But, anyway, but, you, see, <clears throat> but you see, this is a far-right regime. This is a far-right regime and you know, it's not only parliament and two-thirds majority and the constitution. There are 558 city and village mayors in Hungary. 500 out of that belong to Mr. Orban's party. You know, there's on the smallest level, there's nobody in the opposition from the cultural institutions, from the economic enterprises, from state offices, from courts of law, everybody who is not on the radical right, have been thrown out. That has been a purge that compared to which the purge after the fall of the 56th revolution in 57, 58 is nothing, at least what, what numbers are concerned. Well, that went more deeply in other ways. So, you know, so for example, as I said, you know, I, I very much envy you that you can teach at a university. I mean, you know, the idea that I teach in a Hungarian university will, you know, uh, make people laugh very loud in Hungary, uh, me too, including me. Uh, although I'd like to, that's my profession, but I can't. And, you know, so that's, you see, it's, it's a dictatorship of sorts, a softish dictatorship. But what is the disadvantage of a dictatorship when you contemplate the future? That was your, your question. How can you get out from such a system if all the exits are blocked, it's bound to explode. Bound to explode sooner or later. Not today. Not, oh, Hungary is quiet. 
Everything is okay. People are smiling. The pubs are wonderful. You know, who likes them? And, and all that. And, and four million people are starving. And there's no movement to say that the suffering of our compatriots, let alone foreigners and immigrants, is a problem. Because people are both afraid and demobilized, made to be apolitical. That's one of the first consequences of a dictatorship, to make people apolitical and to reduce the moral rank of politics. Repoliticizing without free media, a country relaunching democratic politics when there's one free radio station broadcasting only in Budapest, and there are 30 or 40 right-wing uh, 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 radio stations broadcasting everywhere, where people are not even aware of the existence of rival worldviews, the great majority of who, of course, are always, you know, these urban little islands, but, you know, but... And, of course, that doesn't mean that people do agree. That doesn't mean that people are fond of this situation, but they just don't see any way out. And if you are sincere, what well, I'm frequently asked because you know, because of my past activities, I'm fairly well known in the country. And people ask me, so what will we do? Because winning elections against Mr. Orban is impossible. That's mechanically and technically impossible. No, no, it's impossible but by legislation. No, 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 it's impossible. <coughs> and and you know, so you see, and the main opposition group is even to his right. Okay? So it's both politically and technically and legally and so on, it's impossible. So he said, if we don't change the government through elections, what then? Well, this is what I'm asking. And this is what you have to realize, that in the midst of Central Europe, with all these problems, but you can have somebody like Kiska in Slovakia, but you can't have a person like Kiska in Hungary. Okay? That's impossible. Yeah. And not that there are no such people, of course, they exist. I may even have met them. But, you know, but they won't be not only presidents, they won't be deputy mayors in a village. And so, you know, and everybody knows this. Everybody knows this, that only a violent confrontation can end this. Right? And nobody wants that, nor do I. Nobody wants that, of course. So, you know, so there's a silence that is pregnant with hatred and despair. So, you know, the situation is very, very dangerous. It can, you know, if everything continues peaceful, then even my grandchildren will live in Orban's system. And, uh, and he's a young man, you know, he can be prime minister at 120 years. You know, why not? He's energetic, healthy, successful, leading Europe. Well, people are following his example. And so you see, but still at the same time, here's the note of hope you needed. Uh, when the refugees were still there, there were about 10,000 volunteers in the country to help. They didn't say that we should welcome refugees. We are not in Central Europe, because Central Europe, of course, is Austria and Germany, not us. Let's be serious. And, uh, and we are in Eastern Europe. And, but you see, the thing is that, that still they would help. They were totally apolitical. There was also a demonstration. I never, I never participated in a demonstration that wanted to protest against the government policy, against refugees, and not one political word has been announced. Said, be kind. Be nice. Let's help. And people just dispersed, totally disoriented. But still, it was a manifestation of goodwill. Of course, I don't mean that my compatriots are worse than any other nation. Of course, they're not. But but we live in a live in a world in which normal communal feelings, normal feelings concerning the public interests and the common good either don't exist or they are radical. And so I must, 
ask your forgiveness for being such a Hungarian. Uh, I allow myself this only abroad. Thank you, Adam Michnik. Would like to respond? Okay, I forgive. But I have two comments. First, when I was listening to what uh, you said, I had the impression that I am in Moscow, somewhere in a kitchen, and I am talking to a Russian intellectual or uh, intellectually oriented people. And uh, because uh, they would say that, uh, that there is nothing that can be done, that Putin blocked everything. And I would like to say, uh, like Mr. Putna, I am a historian myself. And as a historian, I know that the future will always look differently from we imagine it to be. And I never thought that Gorbachev and Perestroika would uh, come. I never thought that Solidarita and Valencia would emerge in Poland. I didn't think that there would be a Pope of Polish uh, origin. And uh, I believe that nobody would expect that uh, there would be a Maidan in Ukraine. So I propose that we abandon the black visions uh, and that we take them from a certain distance because it is not possible to uh, believe in pessimism. Pessimism would only reinforce uh, Putin, Orban, and uh, Kaczynski. And my second uh, comment is as follows. I agree that the state and society today are closed, and therefore speaking in terms of the right or the left would be erroneous, because these are concepts of parliamentary democracy. In Hungary, there is no parliamentary democracy, so these concepts cannot uh, function in the country. I can easily imagine a democratic state uh, with the, the right being in power. The, uh, it was Adenauer and um, Mrs. Merkel who are part of the right, and this is why I do not see any reason to um, succumb to pessimism. But uh, as long as we have a choice, as long as we are not deprived of this right, and now I am coming back to what Mr. Putna said. I absolutely agree that the ideas of Havel are based on the belief that we should overcome, step over this horizon and be together. It means that we have to cooperate. It seems to me that Today, it is necessary to formulate a question that would uh, be as follows. Which values, which slogans, which projects should be implemented? Which movements should be asserted? Herman Roche wrote in his book, The Revolution of Nihilism, which is an analysis of Nazism from a conservative and right-wing point of view. 
that it cannot be said that Hitler Hitler is an extreme position. I will try to be a bit optimistic. I think that Gajima has in its uh, analysis of Hungary is right. It's dramatically different than what we can really imagine in our countries. I don't know whether he's right or not, whether Gash is right or not, but what we see today is horrifying me. Not all, it is not only the election of the result in Poland, and I think that Slovakia will continue its way headed by Prime Minister Fico. What uh, shocked us was how, the, how society responded to refugees after a long time, and I really don't want to blame society, that's the worst we can do. Nevertheless, it became clear in my point of view, in my perspective, I started again, which I haven't done a long time. I started to divide people who have empathy to refugees or who say so, or those who re, uh, reject them with all the uh, arguments. So for me, it is, again, a division of society. I can't accept a person who says not to accept anyone, close the borders. It is a person from a different civilization for me. And I am in conflict with that society. That is a conflict I experienced last time with Mechiar. But I must also say one thing that under Mechiar, the question was, are all Mechiar voters mad? Are they really evil people? And then the question was, really hinging on the Hungarians, they were then our enemies. Today, our enemies are the refugees. But when you look at Slovakia today, nobody mentions the Hungarians. The Hungarians are not the enemy anymore. We have new the refugees, but the Hungarians stopped to be enemies long time ago. Society learned how to live with it. Society mastered the negation. And of course, the Hungarians were hated most where they never lived, that is north of Slovakia. That is the same what we do with the refugees. We have no refugees, so we hate them. And I think, I believe, that if we have this luck, then this will pass. And I only hope that we won't commit crimes that will be a trauma. So I hope that we will manage not to do something uh, terrible. And uh, for me, the risk, the real risk is that today, Central Europe starts to get united not only in the resistance to the refugees, but also in its uh, resentment towards the European Union. And that's really crucial for me. It is, uh, of course, not only that we are against the EU, but then the EU is against us too. So what will be then the result of it? That's really my greatest fear, because I think that if we master the situation with all these problems of our regimes and the EU will keep together and we won't leave it, then I think that this process will be the same as in Slovakia in the 90s. Simply, we will cope with it, we will manage it, but there are these many buts. I see that there is a effort to come with some optimistic tones tonight. Yes, we all shine with optimism, no, except Hungarian colleague, because that is national stereotype. We all try to come with optimistic conclusions. I protest. We all three try to be optimistic. So in the Czech Republic, the effort is in the same line. In Slo the Slovakia, you mean? <laughs> No, it's the Havel tradition, and that is what we have to stick to, and it functions beyond the borders of Visegrad. When we made a documentary on Ukraine uh, 
recently, and we traveled two weeks uh, between Kiev, uh, Odessa, Lvov, and Havel functions. It is, and all our countries are a model for Ukraine. We think that our situation is terrible, but for them we are a model, a example to follow, something that you can manage and be successful. So it depends where you stand and from where you look. From Vienna, it looks worse, but when you look at us from Kyiv, it looks well. So if I may, I would like to make a note all this comments, negative comments uh, addressed to the late Havel in the Czech Republic is not really uh, making us optimistic about the political discourse. I Le read today an article about refugees. It was written by Tomáš Halík, who is a Catholic priest, a theologist and philosopher. And it's an article written in the spirit of Václav Havel humanism. It means that I agree with my colleague, historian Putna, that Havel left a legacy which is valuable. It is a way of thinking, a way of assessment, and we see all the time this merchant which makes correct this uh, picture of President Zeman or Kaczynski. So we have to think all the time about whether he does it because he loves the president, uh, the, the particular president. So for me, the situation, what happened in 89 in Prague was a real phenomenon because with comparison with Poland, the descent in Czechoslovakia was elite. Uh, here it were uh, hundreds of intellectual students, independent people, and in November 89, they, uh, the things got concentrated and everything collapsed like a house of cards. And I know something absolutely certainly. I know that pessimists are sad and uh, boring and and optimists are uh, nice intelligent and women like them therefore I vote for optimism if I may I have a personal comment to make I won't ever forget when we had this meeting of Polish-Czechoslovak solidarity in Wroclaw, and then you stood up and said to the whole room, to the enthusiastic public, our next meeting will take place in Prague, in one of the most beautiful cities of Europe, and it will be in free democratic Czechoslovakia. And then Oplos came, and a part of the audience thought, oh, that Michnik. But you, had, you were right. 14 days later, it happened. So ladies and gentlemen, we have some 20 minutes. Uh, uh, for discussion. So if you want to make use of this opportunity to ask our colleagues uh, some questions, we'll be happy if you could tell your name. So some 20 minutes, and Professor Putna has really to leave short before 8 o'clock. So if you have questions to him, maybe we could start with those. 
must ask a question. <laughs> since um, since uh, both as a Ukrainian, since Kiev was mentioned as a good reason for Visegrad optimism, uh, uh, I must say that this is exactly the same way Minsk is seen from Kiev. It is always nice to have at your side someone who is ver doing worse than you, and it really encourages you, and it really keeps you optimistic. So uh, even by way of serving as a source of optimism, uh, you know, for your countries, well, I, I think I um, have to ask this question, but my question is actually addressed to Thomas, to Mr. Thomas. Um, well, and as a woman as well, uh, because, uh, well, I love uh, Adam Michnik dearly, uh, and I love optimists as a woman. Uh, he was absolutely right. But with the, with the pessimists, the situation is not actually that bad, Adam, and that's why I am addressing Mr. Thomas. <laughs> uh, my question is... Um, well, it's kind of a kind of a ridiculous situation. It looks like it is my karma at this forum to console pessimists. Yesterday, I was forced to console Russians, uh, Russian liberals, be because their country attacked mine, and they were miserable because of that. Uh, well, and now I have something to offer. I think to Mr. Thomas. And now I'm getting serious. Uh, I'm really, um, well, kind of surprised that uh, you see this situation in terms of your countries, yes, the regime. Uh, yes, the regime modeled exactly as Adam made the point, uh, though in ironic way, uh, after Putin's model, yes. And interestingly enough, last year, uh, when Putin was still full of hopes for his long-lasting plan of dismemberment for Ukraine, when he entered, uh, when he invaded uh, first Crimea and then Donbass, there had been these negotiations with the other neighboring leaders of the other neighboring countries, and Mr. Orban was the only one who stood up overtly and publicly in May 2014 and said, yes, he is ready to take Transcarpatia. Transcarpatia had been in preparation for Mr. Orban exactly the same way as Eastern Ukraine had been in preparation for Mr. Putin for some 15 years before this whole business started and became visible last year. Uh, as we know from uh, Mr. Radek Sikorsky, Polish leadership of the time kind of rejected the deal. I wouldn't be optimistic that optimistic now about, about the new leadership of Polish if they get such a proposal now to get Galicia, if they refuse it. Uh, well, but okay, that's pessimistic. Um, uh, so uh, since then, I'm using this term, and I'm happy to use it now, well, I'm happy to use it now, that urbanization of Central Europe is actually the trend launched by Kremlin by buying his assets in uh, the political elites of uh, the Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries. According to the famous saying by Mr. Berezovsky, why to buy a factory if you can buy a director? So far, it has worked in Hungary. Why? That's another question. Linguistic solitude, cultural solitude, I mean, uh, you, you, you know better. Uh, but why don't you think in terms 
of the end of this regime? Why, 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 do, why do you think in terms of violence as the only possible option now in your situation? And why don't you think, uh, I mean, I'm really, I'm seriously interested. Why don't you think that once the source of this cancer will collapse in Moscow, Hungary will be free as well? Thank you. Okay, uh, because uh, the Russian influence in Hungary is not important. Uh, it is indeed a, a valuable alliance for Orban politically. Economically, it doesn't matter in the least. And, uh, and uh, it is actually, actually uh, the economy, economy of Hungary is still as much linked to the European Union as ever before. It, it hasn't succeeded. Of course, that was the plan to make the Hungarian economy more independent of the West and cooperate with Russia. But Russia is too weak economically, and it just didn't pan out. There were there's still a few attempts. And uh, yes, indeed, if, if Putin would fall, that would, of course, weaken this kind of regime, obviously, yes. But I, I, I'm not sure how important that is. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But you know what I, uh, uh, on an optimistic note, what I, what I have in mind, you know, yeah, maybe, of course, the whole thing can just rot away and new things can appear. The violence is one danger. I didn't say that it was inevitable. Of course not. <clears throat> but what I'm reminded of in these times of uh, silence and unanimity, after all, uh, the policies of the two far-right parties, because... Mr. Orban's party, the Fidesz, is not much more moderate than the openly neo-Nazi party in terms of practical policies. And even the rhetoric is now has been moderated on the far right. But you know, what the whole thing reminds me of is the following. On 21st of December, 1989, Nicolae Ceausescu, the General Secretary of the Romanian Communist Party and the President of the Romanian Socialist Republic, has called a great meeting on his support. There he was standing on the balustrades of the Central Committee building, and more than 100,000 people marched there with slogans and bangles saying, long live Ceausescu, long live... And he was, you know, beaming and smiling at the crowd, at which moment people in the square they said, long live Ceausescu, uh, well, go to hell, Ceausescu. All of a sudden, it was the same people. It was absolutely identical people who were marching in a disciplined column, you know, and said, what? He said, what? Stand quietly in their places, the famous phrase of Ceausescu. Stand quietly in their places. Stați liniștiți in locurile voastre, in Romania. Okay. And they wouldn't. And in a half an hour, he had to board a helicopter and fly away. So, who were those people? That's the question. Who were those people? They appeared to be the pillars of the Ceausescu-style communal fascist establishment, right? But they weren't. But they weren't. It did just only appear to be so. So it's not necessary that it should be bloody or whatever, but certainly a classical electoral way out of this is not possible because this is the sense of the regime. This is why it has been created, to make it as permanent as it is possible in contemporary Europe. So, uh, so I don't think that, that there are any assurances. But what, where my hope is that I don't think that, that these uh, uh, convictions and political attitudes will solidify into a whole political culture. Well, I mean, actually, yes, all the examples you gave. What was Czechoslovakia a few months before the changes? What was Germany? not so long ago. And now, it's the most liberal and democratic and, and uh, tolerant country in Europe. Germany, right? 
if is this not a huge thing, then nothing is. I mean, Austria, for God's sake. I mean, here, you know, I mean, well, it's the most of a terrible country, really a terrible country, with a terrible past, and terrible mm, political people, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, you have this demonstration, with refugees welcome, I mean, in the country of Haida, and of Strache, and of all those student associations uh, is so intent in kicking ass, you know, still. So, you know, so, you know, that's, that's the fate of tyrants. They can never be sure. They can never be sure. You know, ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, we are weak, ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Köszönöm. Uh, um, excuse me. Uh, if I may, to Oksana, not to be misunderstood, she said that Kiev is a bad example for me. She knows exactly what I meant. It was not what I meant. She knows that very well. And she also knows very well that after coming home from Ukraine, wherever I go in the Czech Republic and Slovakia and elsewhere, I promote Ukraine as a place where people love the European Union, where they have the f European flag in their homes and cars, and for them is EU a symbol where they want to go. And the atmosphere in uh, Kyiv reminds me of our window of opportunity. But I don't want to speak about Ukraine, because then you can't stop me. So that is what I wanted to say. Pan, Mr. Michnik wants to say something? I wanted to come back to what Oksana said about the support to, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on Orban's support for Putin, because he didn't give an answer. He simply slicked out. It's very dangerous. Because I remember, and I know Orban many years. He's not a close friend of mine, but I know him. And I know that he hated Russia. And this turn he made, I remember a few years ago at a conference in Prague where he stated, he claimed that Russia has a fifth, uh, has, uh, a fifth color in our countries. And I asked him why you need post-communists when the German ch Chancellor Schroeder cooperates with the Russians. Why do you have such a hypothesis of communism? And now we see his pirouette towards uh, Putin. It is all very uh, unclear and making us nervous. I see it from the Polish perspective, of course, and the Polish public uh, opinion and policy on Ukraine has been without any comment. So the question is, what will come? It's an open uh, situation. And because we have this traditional hatred to Russia uh, with Mr. Kaczynski, he should not do any turn towards Russia, Russia and actions against Ukraine. But I can't promise that he will not follow Orban and that maybe something very dangerous will happen. We have heard that in 68, uh, in Czechoslovakia then, there was a coup d'etat, and, and all this shit coming out from Brezhnev, and I've been to Prague, 
and I've been invited to the Czech television, and they've asked me what I think about it, and I said that it is nonsense, but why do you ask me? Maybe you should ask Miloš Zeman or Václav Klaus. They should comment on this historic lie. In Poland, we have a covered clandestine anti-Ukrainism. It's sleeping, though. And if peace does something, I can't exclude that nothing will happen. I wanted to say it's right, but I shouldn't do that. They are today very active. The leader issued a statement saying that if they get in government, then I should uh, emigrate to Israel next day because I am his uh, real enemy. So they are obviously pro-Putin. Polish fascists are pro-Putins, pro-Putin, and I really don't know what will come. And I think that Orban has created a very dangerous model, a very detrimental model because of his domestic policy when he destroyed the Hungarian democracy, not only by his anti-European anti orientation, but also because making everything relative uh, or depending on what Putin does. I remember that he wouldn't say that uh, he would like to have uh, Transcarpathia uh, being a part of Hungary. He wanted autonomy for that uh, region. And when Putin invaded Donbass, it was something unforgivable. mal takú stručnú otázku na tému, ktorej sme sa vlastne ešte nedotkli. Uh, okay, the uh, fall of communism was conditioned by economic collapse and uh, the uh, what's uh, going on in Hungary is um, uh, an economic or, or the, the, the gr economic growth in these countries is relatively good and uh, economically speaking these people never had it so good as they have it today speaking about the, the Visegrad countries but uh, at the time when the country ha has it so good as uh, it never had it before there is a mystery and my question is where is this mystery who would like to answer this question? True. And, uh, and the economic situation is very grave indeed. And the development has been very arrested. The deaths are enormous. Inequalities are growing. Poverty is absolutely frightening. For example, in Hungary, well, not, not everywhere, of course. Slovakia and the Czech Republic are richer countries than we are. And but that, but that is, is never true. I don't think that uh, economic uh, difficulties, even economic collapse, necessarily lead to changes, especially to democratic changes. There's no assurance of that. And also, also you cannot say that, uh, that democratic changes have never taken place out of political and moral considerations, even when the economic situation was more or less OK. So there's no, I don't think there's a direct cause, cause and effect relationship between economic problems and political change. Of course, it's not rare, but, but, but there's no such link. And 
And what is very important, though, and why Orban and his imitators are quite successful, that they present the advantage of the middle class, because indeed even the Hungarian middle class has it better than before. That's about two million people in Hungary. But Hungary has nine million inhabitants, and all the rest are doing much worse. Okay? But of course, politically, it is the middle class that counts. They are the participants in the political process, they are the voters, etc., etc., they are influential, and so on and so forth. So you see, uh, creating a national unity based on the hatred of the outside, of the, in, uh, of the fifth column, but you, I don't know whether you know that, that the official theory in Hungary today is that all this refugee flux is organized by the Jews, uh, by George Soros and the Jewish international conspiracy and cabal. So it's, you know, sounds crazy, but this is what the official stance is. And of course, all the old and the new fears and so on create a position in which the enemy is seen to be outside, or the fifth columnists, you know, the politically correct homosexualists, as Mr. Klaus has said, and so on and so forth. Uh, the great enemy, you know, there's a billionaire in Hungary, a great supporter of the government, very influential man, Mr. Seles, who, for example, thinks that all the leftist elites are secret homosexuals. He said that in public. He's the same. He has, he has a television station, a radio, and a daily newspaper, and also he doesn't believe in gravity. He doesn't. He announced that also public. He doesn't happen to believe in gravity. Yeah. What can you do? Uh, there is still a question from a lady. Uh, first of all, thank you for your elegant irony and this special mood of the panel. Uh, it was enjoyable. My question concerns Visegrad as a model. I come from Ukraine and so, sorry, we're again abusing uh, the air. Uh, so, what do you think? Can it be used nowadays for the countries on your eastern borders as a way to, to counteract Putin's actions or this idea of Russian world, and what kind of aliens might it be of Ukraine with, I don't know, Georgia, Moldova, or the Baltic states, or maybe prospectively Belarus or whatever. So is it viable for other countries as a model? Thank you. So we hope that as soon as it will be possible, you will join us and that Ukraine will be a part of Central Europe. That is what we desire. We want to have the departments of Eastern Studies abolished because you, uh, studies on Ukraine are part of it. For me, a positive model is Ukraine a part of Central European Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that we must c slowly come to an end. I would like to thank our panelists, Mr. Michnik, Pan Putna, Pan Tamás, and, and also Mr. Šimečka. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.